Hello, today's lecture video on introduction to epidemiology will lay the foundation for understanding one of the core disciplines in public health and medical research. We will explore what epidemiology is. The session will cover the basic concepts, including measures of disease frequency and association, and introduce the main types of epidemiological studies, descriptive and analytical. Emphasis will also be placed on the utilization of epidemiology in real-world contexts, from identifying causes of diseases and assessing risks, to guiding public health actions. By the end of this lecture, viewers will appreciate how epidemiology serves as the scientific backbone for evidence-based medicine and population health improvement. Let's look at one of the early and classic definitions of epidemiology given by Lilienfeld in Foundations of Epidemiology. He defines it as the study of the distribution of a disease or a physiological condition in human populations and of the factors that influence this distribution. Now there are two key parts to this definition. First, the distribution, meaning who, where and when the disease occurs. Epidemiology starts with patterns, age, gender, geography, and time trends. Second, the factors that influence this distribution, meaning why these patterns exist. This is where we look for determinants, exposures, behaviors, environmental or biological factors that explain why some groups are affected more than others. So, in simple terms, Lilienfeld reminds us that epidemiology is not just about counting cases. It's about understanding patterns and the reasons behind them. It connects the what with the why, helping us uncover causes and design better prevention strategies. Now, if we move to last definition from a dictionary of epidemiology, you'll notice an important expansion. He defines epidemiology as the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states and events in populations and the application of this study to the control of health problems. Here the scope broadens. It's not just about diseases anymore but also health-related states and events, meaning it covers wellness, injuries, risk behaviors and even positive health outcomes. And most importantly it adds the application using what we learn to actually control and prevent health problems. So, together, these definitions show how epidemiology has evolved from describing and understanding patterns of disease to actively applying that knowledge for the betterment of public health. When you think about the core of epidemiology, remember the five W's. A simple way to frame every investigation. Who, what, when, where, and why. These five questions guide every step of our thinking. What is the disease or health outcome we're studying? It defines the health event itself. Who is affected? This tells us which population groups are at risk. When did it occur? That's the time pattern showing trends and outbreaks. Where did it happen? The place component helps us spot clusters and geographic variations. And finally, why, or sometimes how, which uncovers the determinants or causes behind the patterns we observe. A good way to remember this is to think of yourself as a health detective. Your job is to ask these five W's to piece together the full story. Now, these questions also explain how epidemiology is divided into two broad branches. When we answer who, what, when and where, we're doing descriptive epidemiology describing patterns of disease in populations. When we move to why and how, we enter analytical epidemiology testing hypotheses and exploring causal relationships. So, in essence, descriptive tells the story, analytical finds the reason. If students remember that, they'll never forget the heart of epidemiology. Alright everyone, take a close look at this trend. We're looking at flu cases from 2020 to 2024. Now before I say anything, just observe. What's the first thing that stands out to you? Why do you think the number of flu cases has been steadily declining? Could there be any major events during this period that might explain this trend? Do you think this drop reflects an actual decrease in flu infections? Or could it be due to reporting bias, testing changes, or health system disruptions? And finally, if this trend continues, what could it tell us about population immunity or surveillance in the post-pandemic years?
As mentioned earlier, descriptive studies help us understand the distribution of a health event, who it affects, when it occurs, and where it happens. Now let's look a bit closer at each of these dimensions. Who are the people being affected? Where are these cases coming from? And when do they tend to occur? By breaking the data down this way, we start to see the story behind the numbers. Patterns that help us generate hypotheses for further analytical studies. Here is an example. We're looking at secular trends in mortality among adults aged 25 to 44 in the US from 1950 to 2003. What's powerful about this graph is not just the data, it's the dimension of time. When we study diseases over decades, time allows us to see how population health evolves, how new risks emerge, how interventions work, and how societies change. Notice the steady decline in heart disease deaths, something we wouldn't appreciate from a single year snapshot. How does seeing this long-term trend help us understand the impact of prevention, treatment, and lifestyle changes over generations? Cancer mortality also declined, but much more slowly. What does this tell us about the pace of progress and the limits of medical technology over time? Then, there's the sharp rise and fall of HIV AIDS, a powerful reminder of how epidemics and public health responses unfold across time. How does studying trends over time help us identify when an epidemic peaks and when control measures begin to work? So, time doesn't just add numbers, it adds context. By looking at data across years, we begin to see the rhythm of population health, the stories of progress, crisis, and persistence that a single moment in time could never show. When we talk about person in epidemiology, we're asking a simple but powerful question, who is affected? The distribution of disease is rarely random. Certain person-related characteristics can influence who is more likely to develop or resist a particular condition. Think about factors like age. Many diseases cluster at specific stages of life, like infections in children or heart disease in middle age. Sex and gender also matter. Biological differences and social roles shape patterns of risk. Then there's occupation, socioeconomic status, and education. These reflect exposure, access to care, and lifestyle differences. Even ethnicity, genetics, and behavioral habits, such as smoking or diet, can shift disease patterns within a population. So when we analyze person-related characteristics, we're not just labeling people, we're uncovering the human dimensions behind the data that help explain why some groups carry a heavier burden of disease than others. Now let's look at the person dimension of disease distribution, the WHO factor in epidemiology. On the left, we see injury mortality by age and sex in the US 1995. Notice how deaths from injuries are much higher among males compared to females across almost all age groups. The gap is especially wide in young and middle-aged adults, possibly reflecting differences in behavior, occupation, and risk-taking. Also, look at the increase in injury deaths in the elderly. That's often due to falls, frailty, and chronic conditions that make recovery harder. Now, shift to the right side. Infant mortality by race and ethnicity in the US 2001. Here, the differences are striking. Black infants have more than twice the mortality rate compared to white infants. American Indian and Alaska Native groups also have higher rates than average. These disparities highlight how social, economic, and healthcare access factors, not just biology, influence health outcomes. So these two charts together show why person characteristics matter so much in epidemiology. Age, sex, race, and ethnicity are not just demographic labels. They tell us who is most vulnerable and help guide where interventions should be focused. Now let's pause here and look at this map, one of the most iconic images in the history of epidemiology. What you're seeing is Soho, London in 1854. Each small black mark represents a death from cholera, and those dots, clustered tightly around one particular point, tell an incredible story. That central dark circle marks the Broad Street water pump, 
At that time, people didn't yet understand how cholera spread. The prevailing belief was that it came from bad air, the miasma theory. But Dr. John Snow, a British physician, had a different suspicion that water might be the culprit. To test his hypothesis, he did what we now call a descriptive epidemiological study. He plotted every cholera death on this street map and noted the location of each public water pump. The pattern spoke louder than words. Most deaths were concentrated around the Broad Street pump. Houses that used other pumps, even just a few streets away, had far fewer cases. Snow then persuaded local authorities to remove the handle of the Broad Street pump and the outbreak subsided soon after. This simple act of mapping disease by place revolutionized how we think about disease causation. It's one of the earliest and clearest examples of how observing the distribution of disease in time, place and person can lead us to identify its determinants. Today, we remember John Snow not only as a physician, but as one of the founding fathers of modern epidemiology, the man who turned a map into evidence and a hypothesis into prevention. Let's look at an another example. In the early 19th century, childbirth was one of the most dangerous moments in a woman's life. In many hospitals, as many as one in every four mothers died from a terrible illness known as childbed fever or pure peril fever. Doctors and scientists of the time were puzzled. Some blamed poisonous air, others thought it was due to changes in the weather or even cosmic and magnetic forces. In 1846, a young Hungarian physician named Ignaz Semmelweis was placed in charge of the first obstetrical clinic at the Vienna General Hospital. There were two clinics, the first clinic staffed by physicians and medical students and the second clinic staffed by midwives. The system was simple, women were admitted alternately, one day to the first clinic, the next day to the second. Yet, strangely, women begged not to be admitted to the first clinic. Can you guess why? The first clinic, where doctors and medical students worked, had a much higher maternal mortality rate, often more than twice that of the second clinic, where midwives attended deliveries. But why? Both clinics served similar women, had similar facilities, and delivered babies in the same building. Semmelweis started investigating every possible difference the room ventilation, the bedding, even the position women gave birth in. Nothing explained it. And then came a tragic clue. One of Semmelweis's colleagues, a pathologist, died after accidentally cutting himself during an autopsy. The symptoms of his infection were identical to those of the women dying from childbed fever. That's when Semmelweis made the connection. The doctors and students were performing autopsies in the morning and then delivering babies without washing their hands. Semmelweis immediately introduced a simple but revolutionary intervention. He required everyone in the first clinic to wash their hands with a solution of chlorinated lime before examining patients. And then look at what happened. As this line graph shows, maternal mortality among women in the physician's clinic plummeted rapidly from around 12% to below 3%. Nothing else had changed. No new medicines, no new equipment, just clean hands. This was one of the first examples of an epidemiologic observation leading directly to a public health intervention. Semmelweis's insight laid the foundation for infection control and modern hygiene practices. A timeless reminder that sometimes the most powerful innovations in medicine are also the simplest. Now that we've seen how descriptive epidemiology helps us understand who, when, and where a disease occurs, the next logical step is to ask why is it happening and how can we prevent it? That's where analytical epidemiology comes in. We start with observations, the patterns identified through descriptive studies. These observations guide us to potential relationships or hypotheses about causes and effects. Then begins the mechanism, the scientific process through which we test these hypotheses. It involves two key steps. The first is designing a study. We select the right type of study whether it's a cohort, case control, or cross-sectional, to compare groups and identify associations between exposure and outcome. After collecting the information, second step is the analysis of data. We use statistical tools to analyze the data and determine whether the observed relationships are real or just due to chance. 
This process transforms descriptive observations into causal understanding. The value of analytical epidemiology lies in what it enables us to do. It helps establish causal inference, linking exposures to disease outcomes. It supports prevention and control by informing targeted public health interventions. And ultimately, it forms the foundation of evidence-based policy, guiding health decisions and shaping guidelines that save lives. So, while descriptive epidemiology tells us what's happening, analytical epidemiology explains why it's happening, and that's the key to improving population health. As we come to the end of our session, let's step back and look at the bigger picture. Epidemiology is not just about numbers, charts, or statistical models. It's the language of public health. It allows us to describe how health and disease are distributed within a population, who gets sick, where, when, and why. And more importantly, it helps us identify the causal factors, the exposures, behaviors, and environmental conditions that shape those outcomes. Through epidemiology, we move from observation to understanding, from data to action. It's what connects scientific evidence to real-world health improvement, from Jon Snow's cholera map, to Semmelweis's hand-washing revolution, to the analytical tools we use today for global disease surveillance. So, whether you are in clinical medicine, public health, or research, epidemiology is your foundation. It teaches us not only how to measure disease, but how to prevent it, control it, and ultimately improve population health. Thank you for watching and listening. 